A good morning and a blessed Sabbath to all. We want to welcome everyone to our service today and pray that you will be richly blessed as we worship the Lord in the spirit of holiness. We welcome those who are here and those who are following us on the internet. We pray that everyone will be blessed today. We are continuing today to look at the topic living by the word of God. Now, as we study the matter, we see that the Christian life is based on the word of God. All of us have our own natural dispositions and cultivated tendencies to good or evil. So all of us are different in terms of um, disposition and personalities. But to live the Christian life, we cannot live by our inherited and cultivated tendencies. The Christian life must be lived by the Word of God so that everybody becomes, has an opportunity to become equal in that sense, develop the same attributes and characteristics, notwithstanding our um, personal uh, differences, our, our gifts, talents, some are brighter than others, some are, we are different in many ways. But what the Word of God does is to bring everybody on an equal platform of salvation and character development. Everyone can receive the full salvation offered by Jesus Christ. Everyone can fully partake of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Everyone can access the same full and total salvation offered by God. And this comes through the Word of God. And therefore, in order to live the Christian life, we must, all of us, seek the Word of God, find out what the Word of God has to say to each of us individually, and seek to bring the Word of God into our lives. And that is why we are looking at the topic, living by the Word of God. The Christian life cannot be lived without the Word of God, without bringing, without adhering to the Word of God, bringing the Word of God into the life. Let us pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for bringing us here safely today. We ask you to bless everyone who is here, everyone who is following. Amen. Bless the ministry of your word today in this presentation and all that are to follow during the day. Bless your people who are waiting. Bless every individual, every family. Bring us all to that knowledge of your word and that understanding of your word and to the understanding that we are to live by your word we are to bring your word into the personal life into every aspect of the life having every having every aspect of the life transformed and directed and controlled by your word because this is the way that you set up for us we thank you for the times to which you've come and the fact that you are seeking to raise up a people who live by your word who are transformed by your word and in whose lives it is seen that your word is is fully and totally manifested help us to understand this subject so that we shall bring the word into our lives have the necessary faith to trust you and to depend on you and to walk in your ways in jesus name Amen. Now we've been talking about living by the word of God and we've been saying that to live by the word of God is to live by faith. And we've been looking at some definitions of faith. The Hebrews 11 definition of faith is that faith is the substance of things so for the evidence of things not seen. In other words, faith is the assurance that what we hope for, we shall have. And it is like, even right now, having that assurance. The, subs, the, the evidence of things not seen, faith brings the evidence that even though we do not see something right now with the physical eye, 
we have the evidence that it exists or in fact it will come into being at some point in time. We've, we've been also looking at a definition of faith by A.T. Jones. Now, Jones's exact definition is faith is expecting the word of God to do what it says and depending on that word to do what it says. My, um, my interpretation of that has included faith is believing in the word of God and um, depending on the word to do what it says. Now, what I want to do today is to look a little closely at Jones's definition and to determine, in fact, that it is based on the Bible, it is based on the Word of God. It isn't that Jones pulled that definition out of the sky and um, wrote it down and, and shared it with us. It is, in fact, based on the Word of God. Now, the, the, the Word, or one of the texts that Jones used to arrive at his definition of faith is found in Matthew 8. We're going to be looking there, but there's also another text um, in Isaiah that I want to look at to show that in fact faith is depending, believing the word of God and depending on that word so that we can see that Jones's definition in fact is biblically based. So we want to begin then by looking at Matthew 20, Matthew chapter 8 verses 5 to 13. Matthew 8, 5 to 30. I'm waiting for you to find it. Matthew 8, looking at how Jones arrived at this particular definition of faith based on the Word of God. We're, 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 we're talking about living by the Word of God and therefore our, our definitions, our understandings, we need to bring the Word of God to bear. We need to come into contact with the Word of God. That word is living, sharp, quick, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Every one of us that seeks to live the Christian life should bring the word of God into contact with our lives, bring our lives into contact with the word. When the word, when the, when the scriptures are cited at church, when the scriptures are cited, let us bring, let us turn to the scriptures to see the scriptures for ourselves to interact with the scriptures and then we have and, and that's why we need to have our children with us when the word of god is being presented and when we bring our children to church we should be packing toys we should be packing the bible let them bring to church the bible not toys to play with a lot of stuff to be drawing and writing when the sermon is going on when the preacher is presenting we want them from young to also come into contact with the word of god therefore bring them to church with the bible and have them sitting beside you. And when the preacher calls the text, make sure that they turn to the text, or we have them turn to the text. Bring their eyes into contact with the text. Bring their lives into contact with the text from early. Don't pack toys for our children when we are bringing them to church. What are we bringing them to church for? So I'm giving you this opportunity, I'm asking us now to, to come into contact with the Word of God, Matthew chapter 8, reading from verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, that's one of the cities that he frequented in Israel, there, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. A centurion, this was a Roman soldier, but he wasn't just an ordinary soldier, he was a um, he was a soldier in charge of other soldiers. He's a centurion. What does it mean by the word centurion? What does that indicate about his status? That he was a centurion. Was a century. A hundred. And a centurion then was an officer in charge of what? How many? A hundred soldiers. So he was a centurion. This is an officer in charge of a hundred soldiers. And obviously that hundred will be divided into smaller units, etc., etc. So this Roman centurion, because Rome was occupying the um, Judea at the time, came to Jesus beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant left at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. So another definition there, what is the palsy? Any, any, any definitions? Palsy. We see this term in the scripture all the time. Well, what does it mean? Well, somebody's answering. 
Paralysis, good. Um, right, so I checked it up last night. It's um, a form of paralysis. In other words, the muscles are weakened, so weakened you can't move them. They are, they are out of your control. So it could be total paralysis of the body or partial paralysis. In other words, paralysis in some part of the body. Now, have a little um, download that I'm looking at. So there can be several types of paralysis that are named as Beals palsy, partial facial paralysis, bulbar palsy, impairment of cranial nerves, cerebral palsy, a neural disorder caused by intracranial lesions. Now, can't, can't define all of those, but this is cerebral palsy will be a palsy that directly affects the, the brain. Then there's conjugate gaze palsy, herbs palsy, spinal muscular atrophy, third nerve palsy, all, many, many different types of palsy. And the thing is that um, this paralysis, whether it's total or partial, is often accompanied by trembling or shaking. So when, when the centurion said that his servant was at home sick of the palsy, and grievously tormented, I imagine then he was shaking badly. Terrible situation, out of control and in serious trouble. So, the centurion knew that Jesus used to heal, that he healed. And he wanted healing for his servant. Now, this is a man that he knew that the Lord delivered goods. And he... He had a need and he came to the Lord to get the goods because he knew that the Lord dispensed good gifts and rich gifts. So who should we turn to? This was a Roman, a heathen, a Gentile, not a Jew. But he had heard that the Lord was around and dispensing rich gifts and he said, well, I want some of this. And we should recognize that God is our God. Our God is an awesome God. And he also has plenty of good stuff for us. And we should turn up and get it. Call for it. Whatever our needs are, call on the Lord. This was a Gentile. His servant was sitting, he had a need, and he came to the Lord for help. Because he knew that the Lord was around helping. So he said, my servant is at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Listen to Jesus verse 7. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Now, the rest that followed tell me that when Jesus made that statement, it was a setup. Because Jesus knew the situation beforehand. The Lord, the, the Father was, would have revealed to him these kind of situations. So he, he read the situation and he said, I, I, I will come and heal him. Because he, he knew that there was more to come. So he gave the man an opportunity to say, all right, well, calm down. But listen to the centurion. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. So he, he denigrated himself. But then he said what? Well, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So this man knew something about God. He knew that once God spoke the word, the thing would happen. Amen. And we need to know that. Amen. We are dealing with the word of God. We are dealing with God and his word. True. Amen. This man knew, he said, in Acts 30, do I need to come? Where we were, speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Yeah. The word of God, depending on the word of God, living by the word of God. So, and he said, for I am a man under authority. In other words, I have instructions from Rome. Rome has given me authority. And when those papers are delivered to me from Rome, I have authority and I can say to this man, do that. And I can say to the other man, do this. And he does it because that is the authority given to me, invested in me. So therefore, he's telling Jesus, I am just an ordinary man under authority, I just have control over a hundred men, you have absolute authority. When I speak, my word is obeyed, but there's only little old me. 
So you know that when you speak, no matter how far away you are, you can get the job done. Yes. Verse 10. And then Jesus heard it, he marveled. Jesus marveled. Jesus rejoiced. Amen. Notice that Jesus was happy and he expressed the happiness. Amen. He marveled. Never was Jesus behaved with a little excitement. I wouldn't say he was jumping up and down because Sister Osborne would rebuke him. But he was happy. He marveled and he said, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. What did Jesus call the centurion's behavior? Great faith. Jesus said this was great faith. When a man could look at him and say, Speak the word only, and whatever you speak will come to pass. Jesus says, That was great faith. And therefore, A.D. Jones says that faith, he said that the centurion, in manifesting what Jesus called great faith, the centurion. Uh, he, he, he believed the word of God he expected the word of God to do what it said and he depended on the word to do what it said Jesus said that was great faith not just faith great faith depending on the word of God to do what it says here is Jones there is what Jesus pronounced faith when we find what that is we have found faith to know what that is, to, is to know what faith is. There can be no sort of doubt about this, for Christ is the author of faith. And he says that that which the centurion manifested was faith. Yes, even great faith. There then is this, and this is the faith. The centurion wanted a certain thing done. He wanted the Lord to do it. But when the Lord said, I will come and do it, the centurion checked him saying, speak the word only, and it shall be done. Now, what did the centurion expect would do the work? The word only. Upon what did he depend for the healing of his servant? The word only. And the Lord Jesus says, that is faith. Amen. Believing the word of God, expecting the word to do what it says, and depending on the word to do what it says. That's faith. And then depending on the word to do what it says, we do whatever is required of us to receive the blessing. What did the centurion do? He came to Jesus. And he called upon Jesus. There are times when you might have to leave home or you might have to call somebody. Or you might just have to call upon the Lord. Or you might have to go and pick some leaves. Or eat some fruit. Or eat something that the Lord said this will do the job as a matter of fact we are preparing for a final crisis we are preparing for the proclamation of a great final message which we are to proclaim if we allow ourselves to be transformed we are preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ and the Lord has given instructions so if we are, and he says that he will come. So if we are depending on him to come, if we are depending on these things to happen, then we are to follow the instructions given to us for this time in the word of God. And there's more to be said on that. So that passage was Matthew 8. Now something that I like to do, I am sharing it with you. And when I come across these kind of passages, I have a, 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 what I might call, to some extent, an addictive personality. So we can get addicted to a lot of different things. So what I like to do is get addicted on these passages. So I will read it. And I'm going to read it again. Read it tonight, get it tomorrow morning, and read it again because I enjoy it. Okay? Nice. It's sweet. So I've, been, I've read like some parts of the great controversy so many times so as I just get up and, and uh, something hits me I go back to the Reformation and Martin Luther and how he conducted himself how, he, how, he, how the Lord through him brought about this tremendous Reformation and Luther's great statement when he, when he delivered his, his 
presentation before the emperor and he said, he finished by saying, because well, six times they asked him to retract. Retract all that you said. All that you've done, Martin Luther said, well, look, I, as far as I know, the kings have heard, the popes have heard, the emperors have heard. I cannot subject my conscience to men. I must subject my conscience to the word of God. So if I am found guilty, let me be found guilty by the word of God. I have said what I have said. I can do no other. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. <clears throat> and that standing up for what he believed to be right caused the rec well, it gave success to the Reformation, but it encouraged other people to stand for what they believe to be right. One man standing for what he believes to be right can make a big difference by encouraging others, giving others the courage and the strength also to stand for what they believe to be right. God is calling on the people in these last days to stand individually and collectively, collectively but it has to be individually first for what they believe to be right though everybody else in the world goes in the other direction. Amen. And this is, this is what he wants of us. So I enjoy reading those passages, reading passages like these. I'll probably go back home and read it tonight again. Just to enjoy it. So I want to look at, as well, at Isaiah 55. I'm looking here at passages which, which, from which I can see that Jones's definition of faith is based on the foundation of God's word. Because God's word is to be the foundation of our lives, both spiritual, physical, and secular. All aspects of our lives. And God is seeking to prepare a generation of people in these last days whose lives are based on his word. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. It's like as we read, as we read before in Hebrews 11, those people who saw the promises afar off, embraced them and confessed that they were pilgrims and strangers in the earth and they ordered their lives according to the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom for which they were prepared. God wants us to embrace his word today, embrace his promises, bring them into our lives, live our lives according to his word, according to the promises in the, his word, according to the things that we expect will happen, preparing for those things by the word of God. So I'm looking at Isaiah 55. This helps us to understand the Jonesian definition of faith. Looking at verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, bring our eyes, our minds, our faculties into contact with the word of God. Isaiah 55, verse 10, for as the rain cometh down from heaven, from as the rain cometh down, so the rain falling, he's presenting a picture that we know, one that we are acquainted with, and the snow from heaven, we are not so much acquainted with that here in Barbados, but we've seen pictures of it. So as these things happen, these things with which we are familiar, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, and returneth not thither, unless it achieves, accomplishes something. And we are long for some rain here in Barbados right now. The rain and the snow that produce the water, they come down but they do not return until they have accomplished a purpose. But water is the earth, and make it do what? Bring forth and but when the rain falls, you see, things change. Right now the show apple tree is branching and, and leafing and so on. I, I cut down, cut off all the branches so they just spring back up. And the leaves and some are looking pretty and put no blossoms. But the problem is that there's not enough rain, so a lot of the blossoms are just drying off. So I go every morning and I look for the fruit. But only two fruits so far. All the blossoms are coming out and looking pretty, but most of them drying up. But actually we have two, two, two so far. If I'm pumping my apples before they hatch, well, problem. But anyway, so the rain makes the earth bring forth a bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. He's, he's, he's He's talking about things that we know that happen. So he's saying this. Just as the rain does not 
So you know the rain goes in a cycle, the water goes in a cycle, it comes down, it goes through certain cycles, it goes back up through evaporation, it comes down again. He says it does not go back to where it comes from unless it accomplishes certain purposes. And he says, Jesus, God says now, just as that happens, so shall my word be that going forth out of my mouth. When I speak my word, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where to I send. It's the word of God. God says, when I give my word, my word will not come back to me void. It, it's not like you go somewhere expecting something and come back and you had no men go fishing, fish all night and then come back. Sometimes with nothing. Well, we as vegetarians should be leaving the fish alone. Shouldn't be going fishing. But sometimes you might have a potato slip and you think that well the time has come you go and dig you come up and empty hand it some potato vines that bring forth abundantly but God is saying his word will never return to him void it will always accomplish the purpose for which he is saying yeah so John is saying we can believe the word of God, expect the word of God to do what it says, and depend on the word to do what it says. Because why? God says his word can be depended upon to accomplish its purpose. It will never return to him void or unaccomplished. So what can we depend on from the word of God today? What is it? I mean, the Bible is full, okay, but we just want one or two little things to hold on to today that God has said and we can depend on. Now, I had another passage lined up, but I will not go there. I will continue in Isaiah 55 and just look at um, one or two verses that we can hold on to today. What is our situation? What is our problem? What is troubling us? What is it that the Lord requires of us? It might be you, it might be me, it might be somebody else, it might be all of us. But listen up. Still in Isaiah 55. He says, look at verse 6. We're going to look at 6 and 7. And finish today. Because God said his word will not return to him void. When he speaks that word, it will accomplish the purpose that he sent it to. 55, 6. It says what? Seek ye the Lord... Well, he may be found. In other words, there's coming a time that you can seek the Lord but will not find him. So now is the time to seek the Lord. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your situation, now is the time. When there might come a time when you are seeking the Lord and cannot find him. Or there might come a time when you can't seek the Lord because you are not here. So he says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now is the time. There might come a time when you can't call or the time has gone for calling, okay? It says, verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way. That, that's speaking to all of us, you know. Because we have our own ways. We are our own way. The Lord says, forsake your way. Come to my way. Turn to the way that is revealed in the word of God. That is the way. Let, and, and that's all of us. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. What thoughts you think? Some that we wish we didn't think. But the Lord is saying, forsake those thoughts. Forsake, forsake that mindset. That way of dealing with things. That way of thinking. That self-centered way. That tricky way. That way that seeks to get its own by all sorts of unrighteous means. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him do what? Let him return unto the Lord. And what will happen? Is this the word of God? And he will do what? He will have mercy upon him. He's had mercy already, but we can now come and experience personally that mercy. And to our God, for he will do what? Abundantly pardon. Holy pardon. Skinny abundantly and he's pardoned abundantly 
it is up to us to come individually, personally receive that pardon. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Let us do that today. Let us do that right now. Let us call upon the Lord. The scripture says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we want to be saved now, and we want to be saved continually, and we want to be saved into the kingdom of God eternally. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the understandings of your word. We thank you for the dependability and reliability of your word. And help us then, Lord, to put our trust in you, to depend on your word, to, to read your word and to see what it says to us individually and collectively, and to depend on that word and therefore bring that word into our lives, trusting you and depending on you to fulfill your promises, to fulfill your word, to make them real in our lives. As the centurion did. He manifested what Jesus called great faith. Hallelujah. Help us to have that faith. There are things in our lives which need fixing. Help us to trust you, depend on you, and call on you to fix them. Because the centurion called on Jesus. Amen. And we can call because you are our God and we are your people. Glory. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Help us, Lord. Yeah to embrace your word now, embrace the word that says these things will happen and help us then to embrace the word that enables us to make the preparation now, to bring our lives now into harmony with your word, to walk in your ways and to allow you to transform us and bring us into your likeness, into your kingdom eventually. In Jesus' name, bless us the remainder of this day. For Christ's sake, amen, amen. amen.